As I mentioned, you've got your hand out there. Um, I talked about this big database that we've got right now, and I had a student working on this over the past summer. I worked on it with them. And what we did is we took all 1,000 points of pressure pain threshold that we've had in people with neck pain, and we put them into analysis called a latent class analysis. And what that basically says, it does is say, how many different subgroups of people are present within this entire sample? Okay? How many meaningful subgroups are there? A couple interesting things came out of this. First of all, if you're sensitive on one side of your neck, you're probably sensitive on the other side. That we rarely would see a meaningful difference side to side, even if somebody was saying, I've got right-sided neck pain. Which is kind of surprising to me, to be honest. That's not to say it never happens. Occasionally it does happen, that people are more sensitive on one side than the other. But on average, we're looking at bilateral hypersensitivity, and that seems to be normal. That's like the norm. Which is interesting to me because it makes me think, why do we do palpation then? <laughs> does this hurt? Does this hurt? Well, if it hurts on one side, it's probably going to hurt on the other side. Um, so that was interesting. We also then, of course, looked at, okay, if we look at um, local hypersensitivity and distal hypersensitivity, what kinds of subgroups do we find in there? And here's what we found so far that in males, so about 300 males, we've got almost half the, uh, the sample have this sort of global mild hypersensitivity. Okay, not, not dramatic necessarily, but, but sort of a mild hypersensitivity. And just over a third are sort of normal sensitive, as I'm calling it. So they're sort of in, within that, you know, that second or third uh, quartile. Okay, they're within that sort of middle, middle percentile group. Then we've got a group that are sort of locally hypersensitive, but not hypersensitive distally. That was a fairly small group of people. And then we've got a few of these fellas who are just globally hyposensitive. So they're kind of like way off the charts all over the place. In females, sort of a simple, uh, a similar um, uh, pattern there. We've got about half the group that are globally hypersensitive. Really interesting to me. I wouldn't have expected that half of our groups, or both, would be, relatively speaking, hypersensitive. And I kind of am still trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, and then, to, again, just over a third are sort of normal sensitive, so they're, they're basically right on average, bang on average. And then we've got a group that are locally hypersensitive, and then there's another group that we see in the females, but not in the males, that were locally hypo-sensitive. For whatever reason, like their tibialis anterior are fine, but they were really high threshold locally. Although they say they have neck pain, so there's something interesting about that group as well. The reason I put these up here is because these are some of the clinical patterns you might start to recognize in your patients. And the ones that I'm most, I guess, I'll say concerned about in terms of prognosis, or theranosis would be those hypersensitive groups. And it's not a small portion. This is really surprising me, to be perfectly honest, that we have that, that many people in that sort of hypersensitive group. So again, you can go ahead and test this in people. You can take a look at the, at the scores you've got there and see where they fall. And the ones I'm most concerned about are the ones that fall in that first quartile, right down near the end. Second and third are pretty well normal, and the fourth means these people are sort of hyposensitive. That may actually be telling as well. There might be something interesting happening there, but we're not really sure what. Um, right now, we're concerned about the people who are hypersensitive, especially if it's, if it's global. Okay? And this group of people do look different. When we look at their other scores, we look at their pain catastrophizing scores, their pain intensity scores, they are different. Okay? They're scoring higher on some of these sort of negative scales that tell us something is happening. Um, I think I've picked this. You can try and use this as a tool to detect change. I will admit it's not terribly great at detecting change. If you did want to use it though, we've got a score, a change score of about 150 kilopascals or 15 newtons. Probably is good to indicate that there's a fair bit of change there. But if you take a look at that scale, uh, 15, if you look in the, uh, the Newtons, you know, 15 Newtons would be significant going from, say, 24 Newtons down to, up to 9. Like, that's a pretty dramatic change. So you may not see that much change. That's what I'm saying. That This isn't the best tool, in my opinion, for assessing change. It might be something you can do uh, if you want to, but it's probably better from a prognostic or theranostic standpoint. Is this somebody that I think has a centrally sort of facilitated problem happening here? Or is it something that I can maybe I'm comfortable going in and just sort of locally. 
Um, all right, so let's uh, let's give this a shot here. I'll just show you how I would do this. Eric, do you want to be recorded? Okay. All right, it's up to you. You can say no if you don't want to. All right. Have a seat. So, um, if you decide that you wanted to use something like this, a Wagner device, um, they're they're fairly straightforward to use. These ones give you the option of doing either traction or compression. So, for any time you ever wanted to measure traction, like measure the weight of something or whatever, there's a there's a replacement. You can take the little nubby thing off and stick a hook on here instead. Okay, and you can do that. But I normally use the little nubby thing. Generally, what I say to patients is I've got this uh, this rubber uh, nib here that's about the consistency of a pencil eraser. I'm going to start to slowly apply pressure to the skin over top of your muscle. I want you to tell me the moment the sensation changes from comfortable pressure to pain. Okay. Right now, I've got this on pounds of force, and I've got this set so that it's going to store the peak value that it hits. If I don't have this on, then it's going to just go back to zero as soon as I take the, the pressure off. Okay. So I've got a set to store the peak. Just to give you a sense of how sensitive this is, I'm going to zero it when it's upside down. Uh, so if I turn it up, there we go. So it actually did register the weight of the little nitty thing. So they are fairly, uh, fairly sensitive. What I would do here is I'm going to find, in this case, I'm going to find the angle of the upper traps. I'm going to zero it. I normally zero it with the, with the nitty thing up, just so that I don't get that, uh, that bias there. Put it here. And so Eric, I'm going to start to slowly apply pressure. You tell me the moment this sensation changes from pressure to pain. Okay. One thing you'll notice is I'm always going to keep my other hand on to support because I don't want him to feel like I'm just pushing him off the chair. Here we go. So we hit 16.3 pounds of force. Let's see if you take a look at that. And it's for males of the upper traps. 16.3. Oh, he's he's way up. He's way up. He's up in the fourth quartile. All right. Well done. Um, normally, I would then do that uh, a second time. If I normally I do that bilaterally, just because I want to see if there is a difference bilaterally. As I say, normally there's not. Uh, we would usually leave about a minute or so between testing sessions. At at least 30 seconds if you're, if you're in a real hurry, but preferably a minute. After I've done the neck, then I would come down to do the uh, tibialis anterior. Nice, Eric, appreciate it. <clears throat> come down and find the muscle belly here, exactly the same thing. One thing you'll notice is that every time I keep the screen facing away from me as well, because I don't want to be biasing the result here. Okay? And I start to again apply pressure. Okay? 15.8. Second quartile on that one. There we go. Okay. Always do it a second time. If they're both similar, then that's probably my number. If they're different, then I go ahead and do it a third time. We, thank you, see it again. Appreciate that. We don't have a, a whole lot, as I've mentioned several times now, of objective tests for pain. And this is not one either. However, one thing I can do with this, I should expect that all three measurements should be somewhere within the same general vicinity. If they're all over the place, there appears to be no pattern here. It goes from 2 pounds to 20 pounds to 10 pounds. Like if they're just an absolute dog's breakfast, then that is telling me something as well. I am hesitant to say this, so I will say it carefully. It's possible that may indicate somebody who's not being perfectly accurate with their pain report. Again, recognizing that I am someone who believes pain occurs when a patient's in pain. Um, or, the alternative explanation is, this person's nervous system is really screwed up. Okay. So we don't want to necessarily jump to a conclusion, but as we talk about triangulation here, I usually will do this, if, if I've been asked to do maybe a consult, or I've had to do a couple of medical legal evaluations in the past, and usually pain threshold is one of those things that I include. It's one of the earlier things I include. And if I see a really bizarre pattern that doesn't seem to make any sense to me, then one of the things I can say at least is that based on the pattern and findings from pressure pain threshold, it's possible that this patient is unable to accurately report their pain. 
Now, I'm not saying that they're exaggerating or that they're faking, but they're, for whatever reason, they're not able to accurately report that. And therefore, the results of my subsequent tests should be interpreted based on these earlier findings. Okay? Um, what that really means in sort of layperson speak is I'm not, I'm not really confident that anything I'm doing is, is actually accurate because they seem to report all over the place. You know, my, I am not able to triangulate this experience because it's everywhere. Um, you may be able to use it in that way, but I would say I would urge caution in doing so. Uh, so uh, I did have a very, <laughs> very important question from my good friend Jeff Bostick at University of Alberta. Was he the fourth quartile because the assessor is an attractive female? <laughs> <laughs> well played, Jeff. 